All right, we're back in another Sound of Battle Cry. And the name of the message today is The Weaponization of Forgiveness, Destroying Accountability, and Indulging Evil. And this message I've been wanting to do for a while because I have seen a twisting, a perversion, and a weaponization, yes, of forgiveness in culture, in society, especially in the, you know uh, America, Western nations, Western Europe. All these countries that are infected by wokeness and, and the Marxism and all this stuff. But also, it's not just them. There is also an extreme reaction from the other side, and they're uh, perverting forgiveness as well. So, there's just a lot of crazy, confused, unbiblical ideas floating around in society, impacting um, how people are viewing ideas of forgiveness and justice and accountability in society. And it's just... Uh, it's really damaging, but some people use it, like the woke do, as a weapon to um, for people to be able to tolerate evil behavior and allow evil to thrive and expand in society. And this is another weapon that they use to where they take your religion, uh, twist it, and throw it back at you, and 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 try to hold you accountable to the straw man version this twisted fake version of your religion and say if you don't if you don't live up to their fake standard they made then you're the fake actually and you're the usurper of the real christianity and these types of things so uh yeah that's what we're going to be dealing with today and we're just going to be examining the concept of forgiveness um in detail from the bible towards uh between man and god and also between man and man every which way to cover it as much as we can. And hopefully by the end, you'll have a thorough understanding of this. And then also, um, at the beginning, I am gonna show you some screenshots actually of some examples of how forgiveness is being uh, twisted and weaponized and used against people. Okay, so let's get into it. We will look at some examples of how the biblical principle of forgiveness has been twisted to destroy accountability, thwart justice, tolerate evil, and indulge evil. This perversion of forgiveness is used by abusive manipulators and woke activists that try to guilt trip Christians into submitting to their agenda. Yeah, and so I already mentioned, you know, the woke activists a little bit, and they definitely use forgiveness. They twist it and weaponize it to use it against people to push their agendas. But also I mentioned abusive manipulators. This actually works also on that individual level. There are very abusive manipulative people, narcissists who weaponize forgiveness against people to control them and to get people to put up with their evil behavior and so that they have a free pass to continue hurting people, abusing them, controlling them. And they basically will even quote the Bible out of context to manipulate and guilt trip people into putting up with their behavior. Uh, it's a very evil thing, and I've seen that happen as well. And and like I said, we're also going to be dealing with the other reaction where people just don't even want to forgive at all, and they just want revenge, so we'll deal with that too. So next, we're going to uh, switch to some screenshots, and then after we look at those screenshot examples, we'll jump to um, jumping into the study. Okay, so let's look at the screenshot. Okay, so this is the first example. This is um, a screenshot from Twitter. It's about a, um, a news story, something that happened. From Daily Mail UK, Georgia high school football star shot dead in mall parking lot. So there was an 18-year-old football player, and he was killed. Two teenagers arrested. Now, after this kid was a, uh, was murdered, there was a discussion, right? Now, why don't you look at some of the responses here? So, on the one side, we have the reaction, which is, this kid's body isn't even cold yet, and the parents and girlfriend are already falling all over themselves to forgive the murderers and move on? No righteous anger? What a pathetic, broken culture this is. Now, this guy, Jake, he does have a, a good point. Uh, it's a very strange and unnatural thing that right after your own uh, boyfriend or um, 
your child was murdered, rushing to say I forgive you and all this stuff. That's a very weird, strange, unnatural thing. Uh, there's no period of like, like you said, unright, uh, you know, righteous anger, mourning. These, all these are the types of things. It's a weird thing. Um, so let's continue. Then this guy responds, Eric. I think it's the epitome of Christianity to forgive even someone who kills your loved one. Now, just to hold that thought for a second, because on the surface, it sounds okay, but they're twisting it. So let's continue. Jake says, we have differing views on the epitome of Christianity. Then Eric says, uh, all I'm saying is Christ on the cross Ask the Father to forgive the crucifiers. Forgiveness is a central tenet of the faith, and I don't think we should go after the parents of a murder victim for showing Christian forgiveness. It's a great sign of strength that they would. Okay, now this guy is manipulating. It's very subtle, but is a is a manipulation and a perversion of the teaching of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very important tenet of Christianity, and he's all. But first of all, he is perverting what Christ said on the cross, asking the Father to forgive them. We'll deal with that later in the teaching. And and what these parents did, again, this he's twisting it. And we'll move on here. I'm going to show you something funny. This guy, Eric, who's, who's trying to act like he's all, you know, he's super loving and forgiving and pushing all that. Well, someone found a screenshot of this guy Another time, because this was uh, October of 2022, there's a screenshot from um, January 6, 2021, and it said, shoot the protesters, waive the rules, impeach, waive the rules, convict, waive the rules, deny the ability to run for election again. <laughs> So, you know, this same guy that's like, oh, it's the central tenet of the Christian faith and they need to forgive, the parents are forgiving. It's, oh, it's a sign of Christian forgiveness, blah, 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 blah. And then on the other hand, he's saying, shoot the protesters. Uh, talking about what it looks like he's talking about people at uh, the Capitol on January 6th. So, this is the rank ridiculous hypocrisy of these woke people uh, who are infected with this brain damaging virus in their minds that they say these ridiculous things but 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 how he says oh it's the epitome to forgive but also shoot and kill these protesters and our democracy is sacred you know uh, and, and so what that shows you though is they don't care about hypocrisy it's all about their religion. It is a religion. The woke religion, you could say Marxism, really, if you distill it down. Some argue that, but it really is when you distill it down. But anyways, the point is, I, what I want you to focus on is how they manipulate Christianity for their own purposes. They weaponize certain tenets of the faith when it's beneficial to them. When it benefits their narrative. When the faith of uh, Christianity goes against their narrative, they'll condemn it. Or they will condemn those that have a true interpretation. They'll say you're wrong. Okay? So you got to watch that manipulation here. Now let's move on to another example. Uh, just showing who that guy was. Jake Paquette. Football player. Patriots. Well, anyways, continue. Um, here's another example. So someone posted this meme. It looks like he has uh, Ignatius Loyola as his uh, avatar. But anyways, uh, so it's just a meme. They show Christ being crucified. And it's kind of mocking, um, you know, talk, making fun of people who went along with the lockdowns and, and all the other type of stuff during 2020. And it says, I'm just following orders. I have a family to feed. He did do what they told him to. I have to think of my future. My boss told me to. All this stuff. You know, you could you could twist this different ways, but I want to show you the response. This guy says, though they were all forgiven. Okay? Again, this is a 
crazy interpretation. This guy is saying, uh, you know, Jesus said in the cross, Father, forgive them. So that means everyone was automatically forgiven just because Jesus said that. Everyone there, everyone that killed was involved in the crucifixion of Christ. Everyone that mocked him, they were all forgiven. That's what this guy says. And then uh, someone disputed with them. And he says, well, he quotes this, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Uh, Luke 23, 34. Okay, so he's quoting that, saying, because Jesus said that, they were all automatically forgiven. Again, another twisting of this. And then one last other crazy example is about Daryl Brooks. So if you don't know Daryl Brooks is, he's the guy that uh, drove a vehicle through a parade and killed multiple people, murdered them in cold blood, speeding through a parade of men, women, and children. And in his trial... It says in Daryl Brooks' closing statement, he suggested that the families of the victims he killed should start by forgiving him now, be, now because it will help them in their grief. Okay? So the murderer is saying, you should start forgiving me now. It'll help you. As if he is in a position to tell the victims' families how they should feel and that they don't, ha they shouldn't be upset with him, angry at him. Uh, so again, this is a weaponizing of forgiveness in different ways. And notice how this man is a. And, and if you saw any footage from the trial, the guy is absolute psychopath. And he, I think he represented himself in the trial, saying the craziest stuff. It was embarrassing. But anyways, the guy doesn't really care what he did. He doesn't regret. He doesn't repent. And so this guy that murdered all these people doesn't repent is telling these people, yeah, you should just forgive. It'll help you. you. Just forgive me. But if he was let out tomorrow, he'd have no problem going and doing it again. And so you can see how evil people utilize forgiveness to as a free pass for them to continue doing their evil okay so anyways that's enough for those examples let's go back to the uh, note okay so now we're going to get into the study and we're just going to go through the bible lay this out plainly logically systematically show you as a whole you can't just take a couple verses out of context say, oh, Jesus said, forgive them on the cross and that, oh man, then that's it. That's all we need to know. You know, you have to, when you're, you're un, trying to understand a subject, a doctrine, we need to take what it says in scripture as a whole, throughout the whole Bible, so that nothing is contradicting each other. Verses aren't contradicting each other. One book is not contradicting another book and these types of things. It's consistent. And you will see what the Bible plainly teaches, because the Bible says no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Okay? So, let's get into the study. First of all, the command to forgive others. Does the Bible command to forgive? Absolutely it does. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Jesus said, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Talking about the Lord's Prayer, Right? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We are told to forgive our debtors, those that have done, um, those that have sinned against us. Here's another verse. Here's another passage. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times 7. Okay, so again, we have another passage where Jesus is telling uh, Peter, you, you need to forgive when someone sins against you 
How often? He says 70 times 7, meaning there's not a limit. There's not a number where it's like, okay, you hit 7 times, now you stop. Okay? So these are some of the main plain passages saying, yes, we should forgive others who have sinned against us. Now, if you just stop there, then it'd be very easy to manipulate these verses, just like the other ones, and come up with your own doctrine and teaching about it, which says just forgive indiscriminately under any circumstance. All You just forgive everyone no matter what, and there's no conditions. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And it's dishonest, it's disgusting, it's manipulative if you try to twist the Bible to teach that. Okay? So now having seen these commandments, we are going to look at everything in context. Forgiving, first point, is forgiving others is compared to how we were forgiven by God for Christ's sake. Okay? So this is the first thing we have to look at. The first thing we're looking at is how forgiveness works between man and God. Okay? Because when it comes to salvation, there is the matter of forgiveness. Okay? We need to be forgiven of our sins by God. And what we need to see is what God says about that process, how forgiveness works between God and man. Okay? And because the point is forgiving others between man and man is compared to how we were forgiven by God. Okay? So in order to forget to figure out how it works between people, we need to first look at how it works between God and man. So let's look. Uh, Because the Bible says it plainly. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Okay? So, it clearly says, it's talking about forgiving one another, And we forgive one another in the same way as Christ has forgiven you. Okay, so let's move on to the next passage to back this up. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, remember that, okay? We're not supposed to have bitterness, wrath, anger, evil speaking. With all malice, it says, put that away. We should not have any of that in our hearts. And that's one of the biggest reasons you do need to forgive. Because you don't want to have bitterness, wrath, and anger. We'll talk about that more later. Verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. There it is again. Even as, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay, so again. It says, forgive one another in the same way that God forgave you for Christ's sake because of what Christ did on the cross, okay? That's how the forgiveness works. So it says, the way that it works with God, that's how it works between you and other people. That's how it works. So we have to figure that out. How did God forgive us? That's what we're going to examine. If forgiving others works the same way as how God forgave us, how did God forgive us? We're going to break that down so it's very easy to understand. Step by step. Let's look at it. First, all have sinned. The Bible says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone in the world has sinned. Everyone who has ever lived and ever will be born has sinned. Next point, all are guilty before God because of their sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay? So the law shows people their sin. The Bible also says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And it it says that every mouth may be stopped. No one has excuses. And that everyone, all the world may become guilty. The law shows you that you have sinned. And therefore, it shows you that you're guilty. You have lied. You have stolen. You have lusted, coveted. You have done 
taking the Lord's name in vain, had other gods before you, whatever it is, you have sinned. And because you are sinned, you are guilty before God. Next point. All deserve to be punished for their sins. Ezra 9, 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. So in that particular time, they had some things happen, but they said that what happened was less than our iniquities deserve, less than we deserve for our sins, the punishment, which means they deserve to be punished for their sins. And that's true of everyone because all have sinned, all are guilty, and therefore all deserve to be punished for their sins. Next point. Well, one more verse to back that up. 2 Peter 2, 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Okay? The unjust will be punished in the day of judgment. And they deserve to be punished because they're guilty, because they have sinned. Now let's go on to the next point. All of our sins were imputed to Jesus Christ on the cross. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay? God laid all of the sin of mankind. Every sin that has ever been committed laid on Jesus Christ. Imputed to him as if he had sinned, even though he had not sinned. Which says right here, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He knew no sin. He had never sinned. But he became sin. He was made to be sin. And all the our iniquity was laid on him. Imputed to Christ as if he had sinned. Jesus was punished for our sins as well. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Okay? He was wounded. He was punished in our place for our sins. Here's another one. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Christ is just, we are unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. Would you believe that some people deny substitutionary atonement? But here it is. Clear as day. Christ suffered. He was punished for our sins. Clear as day. Now, having said all that, when Christ died for our sins, he opened up the possibility of forgiveness. The basis of being able to be forgiven by God is the substitutionary sacrifice of of Christ. That is the basis of us being able to be forgiven. We would not be able to be forgiven unless Christ died for our sins. He was punished in our place. Okay? It, the sins were imputed to him and then punished for our sins. Okay? So that opened up the possibility of forgiveness of sins because if we have sinned against God, we're all guilty before God, we deserve to be punished by God, that means we need to be forgiven. We need to be forgiven of our sins. And what Christ did is the only way that we could be. Now, this gift of salvation, which includes forgiveness of sins, cannot be earned by doing good works. Let's see what the Bible says. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay, clear as day. It's so plain in the Bible. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. That is not what saves us. Works of righteousness, trying to do, trying to be a good person, trying to do, uh, keep the law, trying to do acts of charity, and all these things, that does not save you. Works of righteousness do not save you. The Bible says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It says there is none righteous, no, not one. Here's another verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. 
and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, saved by faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is not of works. You are not forgiven because you do good works. It's not of yourself, something that you do. It is, why? Lest any man should boast, or, or else you could go to heaven and say, hey, I got here, and everybody else didn't get to heaven because of my good works. I did this, I did that, I did this. Therefore, I am forgiven and I get to come here. And so there's a boasting of self-righteousness. But here's the point. You cannot cover up your sin or pay for your sin with your own works. It's not possible. And no one who believes, who tries to mix works into salvation and forgiveness has any answer for this. None. We see that we have sinned against God. We are guilty before God. We deserve to be punished. We need to be forgiven. And so that means our sin needs to be covered. Our sin debt needs to be paid to satisfy the justice of Almighty God. And it is not possible that our works can cover up the sin or pay for the sin. The Bible is so clear about that. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Now, there's supposed to be works after salvation, but it is not something you do to earn salvation or to earn forgiveness. It's not how it works. That would, If that were the case, that would make the sacrifice of Christ worthless. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God for... If righteousness can't come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness come by the law, if you could be declared righteous by God by keeping the commandments of God, of the law, then there would have been no reason for Christ to have died. He died in vain. There was no purpose of his death. Because why would he die if you could just do it yourself? You can earn salvation. You can earn forgiveness. You can cover up your sins with your good deeds. You can satisfy the justice of Almighty God with your good works, with your acts of charity. You can do it. Oh, what do you need Christ for? You don't need Christ. He's dead in vain. See how that works? So you cannot cover up your sin or pay for your sin by works. You, are not, you do not earn forgiveness by your good works. But, but, just because you can't earn your salvation doesn't mean there aren't conditions to receiving the gift of salvation. People don't like that word, but we're going to talk about it more than once. And the word is condition. Conditions. Yes, God has conditions 100%. And if you deny that, you deny plain scripture, which I will show you. Okay? So just because you can't earn salvation, you can't earn forgiveness by your works, does not mean that there aren't conditions to receiving the gift of salvation. I'll show you. God's forgiveness has conditions? What? Little word on that. The phrase unconditional forgiveness, I believe, was conceived in the mind of the devil himself. Absolutely, 100%. It is a phrase used to tolerate and indulge all manner of evil behavior. And it does not exist in the Bible anywhere. Find where it says unconditional forgiveness. Find where it teaches unconditional forgiveness. A forgiveness with no conditions. Find it. Because it's not there. For instance... I will show you. Earlier we read the verse. Matthew 6, 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then when you keep reading, in the same chapter, Matthew chapter 6, you see in verse 14 and 15 what? For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Hold on a second here. 
So right after Jesus tells us to forgive others, he tells us there is a condition for the Father's forgiveness. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. That is a condition for forgiveness by God. Right there. Right there he says, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's a condition. Jesus Christ said that himself. Now, let's explain that a little bit. This verse doesn't mean that forgiving others earns salvation and forgiveness of sins. Okay, It's not that, oh, if I forgive someone, now I've earned my salvation and God's going to forgive me. No, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. And that's why there's so such misunderstanding about forgiveness. It's perverted. Let me tell you what it means. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. As I read the verses earlier. What it does mean, and I'll strengthen it more later. What it does mean is that God will not forgive those who cling to bitterness, anger, revenge, and hate in their hearts. When you forgive your debtors, you are letting go of all feelings of anger, hate, bitter, and bitterness towards those who have wronged you. You are letting go of any desire for revenge or wanting to see that person suffer. You give that all up to God. That is the root of it. And it's interesting because we talk about a root. Well, how about right here? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Many are defiled by a root of bitterness. Where does bitterness come from a lot of the times? Refusing to forgive those in your heart, those that have sinned against you. And so they refuse to, to forgive. They cling on to it. They have bitterness, anger, revenge, desire for revenge in their hearts, hate in their hearts. They refuse to let it go. They cling on to it. Resentment. God says no. You have to let all that go. Give it up to him. Forgive them. Forgive them meaning let it go. You no longer want to take revenge on them, see bad things happen to them, and, and, and dwelling on thoughts of the evil things that they've done, and you're upset about it. Maybe for years and years. You still haven't let it go. you got to let it go. You have to give it up to God. That's what it means to forgive your debtors. Pray, pray about it. And even as a Christian, even as someone who's been saved for years, it can creep up on you. That's why it's part of the daily prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's part of the daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and... Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's a daily thing you've got to watch out for. Please, God, help me to forgive those who have sinned against me that I would not have bitterness in my heart, that I would not uh, feed any, a root of bitterness, that I would not allow that to spring up, to take root. Neither give place to the devil, the Bible says. Well, you're giving him a place if you're holding on to any bitterness, bad feelings towards someone. You've got to let all that go. And you have to have help from God. You have not because you ask not. You've got to ask. God, please. Please help me to forgive those who have done me wrong. I can't keep thinking about it. I can't keep allowing this to haunt me. To control me. To affect my life. It's affecting my joy, my peace, my love. Help me to forgive those who have sinned against me. Give it all up unto God. Let it go. It's not going to help you by holding on to it. It's only going to hurt you. There is no upside to holding on to it. Let it go. That's what it means. To forgive your debtors. Give it up. Now, this brings us to the next point, which is repentance. 
And this is a huge point I want you to pay attention to because this explains so much of the twisting of forgiveness. Okay? So, dealing with repentance over and over again. Repentance is said to be required for salvation. So, remember, we talked about earlier that it's God says, forgive others the way that forgiveness works between man and man, between people and people, is the same way that it works between God and man. So let's look. Over and over again, repentance is said to be required for salvation. Let's look. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus said plainly, repent or you will perish in hell. Repent or perish. Turn or burn. Here's another one, Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that your sins may be covered. Well, what's tied together with that? Repent. Repentance. Here's another one, Acts 17.30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere at all times are commanded by God to repent. Okay? Repent or perish. Repent that your sins may be blotted out. All men everywhere commanded to repent over and over again. Repentance is said to be required for salvation. So the next question is, what is repentance? Because this is argued about, again, this is perverted. This is twisted. Especially in the fundamentalist movement. It has been absolutely butchered for decades. But let's see what the Bible says. What repentance is. I have, I have multiple teachings explaining this in great detail. So if you want more on this, go watch repentance teachings I have. One's called Repentance, What It Is and Why I Preach It. Another one is about repentance, uh, part two, confessing and forsaking and all this stuff. Then I have another one called What Repentance Is Not. And so there's quite a bit there about that. But anyways, for the short version, here it is. What is repentance? It is a broken-hearted sorrow for sin, hatred for sin, confession of sin, turning from sin and turning to God. That's what repentance is. That is the biblical definition of repentance. And let's go through that each part. Broken hearted sorrow for sin. Let's look at the verses here. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Those that are humble, contrite, broken heart. But the Lord is nigh to them that are of a what? A broken heart. Here's another one. Psalm 38, 18. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. That is a verse in the Bible. I will be sorry for my sin. That's part of repentance. Godly sorrow for sin. Broken hearted over your sin. Especially when it comes to salvation. Your heart should be broken over your sin against a righteous and holy God. He is a good God that you have sinned against. Lived in rebellion against your whole life. Yes, your heart should be broken over that. Next point, hatred for sin. Psalm 119, 163 says, I hate and abhor lying, by, but thy law do I love. Now, some may say, oh, you should never hate. You should never hate anything. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> that is wrong. You are supposed to hate evil, hate sin, especially, primarily, your own sin first. Don't be running around jumping to hate other people people's sins before your own. That's what the self-righteous Pharisees do. The first thing you're going to do is, I hate my sin because it has separated me from God. I hate and abhor lying. Here's another one. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, arrogancy, the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. Again, it's okay to hate evil. In fact, what does it show? That is a sign that you fear God, is that you hate evil. And what, what are some evil things? Pride, arrogance. 
evil things, sins. You're supposed to hate your sin. Next point, confession of sin. Another thing plainly taught in the Bible. Even more than I have right here. But 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You cannot say you have no sin. Don't make excuses for your sin. Don't cover up your sin. Don't justify yourself. You have sin. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, not to a priest, by the way, to God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you see here how forgiveness of sins is directly tied together with confession of sins. So let's say in your heart you are sorry for your sin, you're brokenhearted over it, you hate your sin, but you should all also confess with your mouth out loud, yes, yes you should. You should drop down on your knees by yourself and confess to God, God be merciful to me a sinner. I am sorry that I have sinned. Say it with your mouth. Yes, confession. Here's another one. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Don't try to cover it. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confess your sins and you will have mercy. You will have for forgiveness. Confess your sins. And finally, turning from sin unto God. So that's combining those two together. It's not just turning from sin. It's turning from sin unto God. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So you see the, the connection between repentance and turning away from sin. It means to turn your back on your sin. In the context of salvation, turn your back on a life. An entire lifetime of sin and rebellions, rebellion against God. Turn away from it. And turn to God. Here's another one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how that ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So what do we see here? They turned from their idols to God. You're facing one direction, your sin. And you turn and you face the other direction towards God. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So you're... Yeah, brokenhearted, sorrow over sin, hatred for sin, confession of sin, turning from sin and turning to God. That's repentance. And the Bible says if you want forgiveness of sins, you need to repent. Now, all of those things are wrapped up in repentance. And this is all an attitude of the heart, not doing any works. There is nowhere in here that I have ever said Oh, you need to stop doing all types of bad things and then God will forgive you. That's not what I said. And I never will say that. It is a totally different thing to have an attitude of the heart where you think about all your sin. You're confronted with it. The Holy Spirit pricks your heart and you're convicted. And you feel sorry for that sin. You hate it. You, you want to turn from it in your heart. You're like, I hate that. I want to turn from it. I want to forsake it. I don't want anything to do with that anymore. And you cry out to God. That's not going around trying to do some works and trying to clean up your life, turn over a new leaf. That has nothing to do with that. This is, a, a, this is an attitude and a turning of the heart. It's not doing works. It's all wrapped up in repentance. One more point. Faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice is what saves you. But only a repentant heart can have saving faith. They are two sides of one coin and cannot be completely separated. The Bible says right here, Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. They go together. Think about all the times Jesus said, repent ye and believe the gospel. That's repentance and faith. Repentance toward God, faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. They go together. So repentance doesn't necessarily save you, 
Faith in Jesus Christ is what saves you, but a repentant heart puts their faith in Christ because it clears everything out of the way. If you're clinging onto your sin and rebellion against God, you're not going to put your faith in Christ because you don't care about your sin. You don't see how you have offended God. You don't care about it. You're still clinging to it. But with repentance, you're sorry for it. You hate it. You turn from it and you now you're, you're letting go. Your hand was closed. Now your hand's open to receive the gift. And you reach out, Jesus, save me. I believe what you did. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call upon him, save me. And my hand is empty now. I have put down the shotgun of rebellion. I'm not clinging to the life of sin and rebellion anymore. I don't want that. That's repentance. But faith receives as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God but you can't be clinging to your sin to receive Jesus Christ okay so repentance and faith go together faith is what saves but only those who are repentant have a repentant heart put their faith in Christ and that's how it works. That's why the first command is always repent. Jesus said, repent or perish. Repent and turn. That's the first thing. First repentance, then faith. That's how it always is throughout the Bible. But the thing we're focusing on here is to show you that there is no forgiveness without repentance with God. Never in the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, never, ever, ever is there forgiveness without repentance. Let's continue. Having said all that, this shows that repentance is a condition to receive forgiveness with God. Repentance, it, there's that word again. Ooh, that word, they don't, people don't want to hear. Condition. Repentance is a condition to receive the forgiveness of God. This brings us back to the verse we read earlier about forgiving others. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay? So it says, forgive one another, even as in the same way, that God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Well, how did God forgive you when you repented? Because you repented and put your faith in Christ. Forgive others as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How did God forgive you? With repentance. Clearly, we showed that. That's what the Bible says. God forgave you through repentance. Therefore, that's how forgiveness is supposed to work between person and person. And there's a lot more to back that up. Let's read more about repentance and forgiveness. The Bible plainly says that proper Bible plainly says the proper process for someone who has trespassed against you, who has sinned against you, is this. Let's look. Luke chapter 17 verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day, turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So what does it say? If your brother sins against you, number one, rebuke them. You need to confront them. The Bible clearly says if someone sins against you, it says your brother, right? So they're supposed to be a professing Christian. You rebuke them, which means you confront them. You tell them, hey, you did this against me. That was wrong. I'm up, you, that upset me, whatever it is. And you confront them about that. You tell them the problem to their face. Not go tell them, don't tell someone else. Don't go gossiping behind their back, backbiting. You go talk to them alone. Number two, if they repent, forgive them. If, see the word there? If he repent. It does not say, 
if he trespass against thee, then just forgive. It says confront and if he repents. It does not say, oh, I just automatically forgive him. That is not a Bible teaching. If he repent is the condition here. If they do not repent, you are not obligated to tell them that they are forgiven. Now, I want to make something clear here. I am not saying that you should harbor unforgiveness in your heart. That is, the Bible is against that strongly. What I am saying is telling that person you are forgiven when they have never said, I am sorry. That is a perversion. It's a satanic, evil, wicked, <laughs> twisting and perversion of forgiveness. We are not told to do that. You don't go tell someone, I forgive you, who has expressed no sorrow for what they have done against you. Give them a free pass. There is no, let me explain this a little more. There is no reconciliation without repentance. Okay, so look at this word here. Okay, we talked about forgiveness, but let's look at this word here, reconciliation. There is no reconciliation without repentance. Now, what does that mean? Reconciliation. Well, the definition in the dictionary is the act of reconciling parties at variance. Renewal of friendship after disagreement or enmity. Okay, so let's say there's some, something uh, happens and it hurts your friendship with someone. There's parties at, you know, at variance with each other. They're having an argument. They have problems with each other. If the problems are resolved, then they are what? Reconciled. But there is no reconciliation without repentance. If you tell them that they are forgiven when they refuse to repent, you are granting them indulgence. What's that word mean? Well, it's in, in the dictionary. It says indulgence, free permission to the appetites, humor, desires, passions, or will to act or operate forbearance of restraint or control. This is what you're saying to them. If someone does something bad to you and you, they don't repent, they don't say they're sorry at all, they're no remorse, and you say, I forgive you, you're granting indulgence. And what you're essentially saying to them is this, do whatever you want to me and there will be no accountability. Do not restrain yourself. I have no boundaries. Continue in your sin and I will continue to forgive you. Do whatever you want. Continue. Please keep hurting me, manipulating me, abusing me over and over again. Do whatever you want. Keep on doing it. You've hurt me. You've hurt my family. You've hurt my children. You hurt my spouse. You hurt this person, that person. And no, we, no one cares. Just keep doing it. We'll just forgive you. We just automatically forgive you. No matter what you do, we'll do whatever you want. Do what thou wilt because you'll be forgiven. See how insanely twisted and disgusting and satanic this is? And do you also see how the devil would love for people to believe this? Oh man, it's just a free pass to do whatever he wants and no one is going to stop. Evil people, predators, narcissistic, abusive people, they love this. And you think they don't learn scripture in order to manipulate you so you do this? You feed into this? Absolutely they do. In fact, some of them become pastors. Some of them become pastors and they're never held accountable. Oh, oh man, you need to become a, you need to be accountable to a church. Where is your accountability, pastor? When have you ever been held accountable in your life when you were wrong about something, when you did something wrong to somebody? How about when you uh, intruded into the sphere of authority in a in a person's family and you hurt someone's marriage? which was completely outside of your role, and you never apologized for that. You were never held accountable for that. Oh, just forgive, just forgive. Well, where's your accountability? See? See how that works? So, if people can figure out, well, hey, all I got to do is pretend I'm a Christian, learn a few little lines here and there, 
And no matter what I do, they have to forgive me. And they let me do whatever I want and I get away with it. And if it gets too crazy, I'll just go somewhere else and do the same thing and start over. And no one will stop me. I got a free pass. The forgiveness, the indulgence pass. And that's how it works. And there's so many examples of this all across the country, across the world. I'm sure many of you listening have your own stories. Look at the evil and the damage this has caused. It's disgusting, reprehensible, twisting of the scriptures for evil. <laughs> Let's continue. Is that biblical? Absolutely not. To say, do whatever you want, there'll be no accountability. If that were biblical, then why? I'm going to give you three points that destroy this right now. If that were biblical, then why? Is there a specific process outlined in the Bible called church discipline which ends in someone being kicked out of church if they refuse to repent for trespassing against their brother? Now, the point of church discipline is that if someone does something wrong, they you're supposed to have, you know, it says individual, confront them if they don't listen. They're, they're, they're trying to get someone to repent, trying to, to hold them accountable, and then everything would be reconciled, and it's to win your brother back over. It's not just instantly, oh, we're done with you, goodbye. It's going to great lengths to try to bring about a reconciliation. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Okay? So if someone does something to you directly, okay, someone specifically does something against you. That's what this circumstance means. You go and tell them, alone. Don't tell someone else. Don't involve anyone else. Just you and them. Try to confront them. Say, hey, you did this to me. That was wrong. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained their brother. What does it mean if he shall hear thee? If they say, okay, you know what? I I'm wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. They apologize. That should be the proper response. But if they don't listen, well, they're making excuses for themselves. They're justifying themselves. But if you will not hear thee, then you got to go take take with thee one or two more. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So you try again. Say, hey, this is what happened. This person did this to me. And listen, guys, this is what happened. Everybody knows all the facts. This person needs to repent. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Now let's involve everyone, the entire church. Say, we tried it alone. We tried with a couple people. They still refused to repent after two times. This is the third and final chance. Tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man as a, and as a publican. Let him be unto you as a lost person. Out of church. They're done. But there's a specific process that is to be gone through. It's not just willy-nilly. You don't jump on people oh you're out and you kick them out for no reason and you especially need to give them an opportunity to answer the charges against them first alone then and then the process but if they've been given opportunity three times and they still don't repent well then they have to go okay now if if it, we were just supposed to automatically indulge people automatically forgive people then how come this process is outlined in the Bible? That someone did something wrong, you confront them. They don't listen, you tell someone else, it, it, more people. And then you, if they don't listen, you tell the church. And if they don't listen, then they're kicked out? Hey, I thought you were just supposed to forgive them. Just forgive them, let them do whatever they want. No, it says there is accountability. There's accountability process. Here's another one. If we should just forgive to grant indulgence, why does the Bible say to separate from professing Christians who live in open, unrepentant, habitual sin? Why does it say that? Let's look. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. Any man that is called a brother means someone that is a professing Christian. I have written unto you not to keep company, not to fellowship with, 
If someone is a, called a brother, a professing Christian, be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, a railer, a drunkard, an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. Don't even be seen eating with them in public because you don't want other people to say, hey, this guy claims to be a Christian. He's sitting here with that drunk guy I saw stumbling out of the bar last Saturday. Oh, this is the guy that's the fornicator running around fornicating with all these women. All this other type of stuff. That's bad for your testimony. Blas cause the word of God to be blasphemed. You're supposed to separate. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not you judge them that are within? It's more strict with them that are professing Christians. But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Again, they're a professing Christian. They're, they're getting drunk. They're fornicating. All these, they're, all these things confront them, rebuke them. If they don't listen, they don't repent. It says separate. Oh, I thought we're supposed to just automatically forgive. Let them do whatever they want. Continue on to sin, 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 sin. And that's it. Just keep on sinning. It's no problem because we forgive you. Wrong. Absolutely 100% wrong. That is unbiblical. It says separate because that's accountability. Here's another one. One last example. If we should just forgive to grant indulgence, why does the Bible say to confront heretics twice and then reject them if they do not repent of their false doctrine? Okay, someone's a, what's a heretic? Someone that is a clear line that someone's a heretic is they deny clear Bible teaching about attributes of Jesus Christ. They say Jesus, they deny the deity of Christ, that Jesus is God. They deny the virgin birth. They deny the literal resurrection of Christ. They, they deny, you know, basic truths of the Bible, the infallibility of Scripture. You know, all these are the types of things. That's, it's heresy, right? Clear heresy. If they say there's some other way of salvation besides Jesus Christ, heresy. Absolute heresy. And so that's what a heretic is. Now, this is a problem with their belief, with their doctrine. This isn't just their behavior, right? So it talked about separating, holding people accountable for what, how they behave. It also says holding people accountable for what they believe. Look at what it says. Titus chapter 3, verse 10. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted, and sinneth being condemned of himself. By the way, that subverted, that word subverted means entirely destroyed, overthrown. It means their mind is messed up. Someone that is believes in heresy, right? You give them a chance. It says give them a couple chances. Say, hey, you are wrong about this. Here's an opportunity for the truth. Either you tell them, say, here, Hey, why don't you watch this video? This corrects your false doctrine. Look at this teaching. Then they don't listen. Okay, listen to the teaching. I told you. You're wrong about the teaching. Here's the scriptures. They still don't listen. It says reject. You don't continue to argue with them. You don't fellowship with them. You don't endlessly debate with them. It says you reject, you separate, say, all right, they're a heretic. They don't want to listen. That's it. Again, it doesn't say, well, you just forgive them and let them continue spewing their heresy and you just, you just stay around that and you endorse it. No problem. Oh, you're just forgiven. Again, accountability over and over again. I just gave you three clear examples in the Bible where it says, hey, here's a process of holding someone accountable for how they behave, how they, what they believe. And if they don't listen after being confronted, they are to be separated from. Not being told, I forgive you. Did it ever say, 1 Corinthians 5, hey, this person that's a fornicator running around, maybe they fornicated with your wife. You say, hey, I forgive you. Hey, it's a murderer. Oh, you killed my child. I forgive you. No, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Wow. Wow. Man, that seems harsh. Oh, Nate, that's that. You, it sounds like uh, hateful. It's it's harsh. That's Bible. 
I just quoted the Bible to you. Okay? You are living in a false, fake, apostate, Disneyland Christianity that is an insane perversion that is so far from the scriptures it's not even funny. Which again, why I've said over and over in multiple teachings, we are ready for the man of sin. Let me tell you. What, what more? How much more apostate do we have to get? Because the scriptures are out the window. Okay? But anyways, that's plain scripture right there. Process of accountability. So that completely refutes the idea that we just need to allow people to sin against us, say they are forgiven, tell them they're forgiven, and allow them to continue to doing the wickedness they were doing with no accountability. Completely refutes and destroys that notion. It's false. Okay? We're getting closer to the end of the teaching. But I want I got some very important things to, to that I need to finish up with, and I'm going to deal with those scriptures about Christ on the cross, okay? So stay with me. That brings us to the verses which are quoted most often to justify the per, this perverted, indulgent forgiveness. Okay, so let's go back to that. Luke chapter 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors... One in the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay. So here's the statement, which all these people are quoting, saying, this is the scriptural proof that they have. This is the scriptural authority that they have to say, we should just go around forgiving everyone, telling them they're forgiven, no matter what evil they have done. And they're just automatically forgiven. Even that one guy said, everybody there that was a part of the crucifixion, they were all forgiven. Just because Jesus said that forgive them. Okay, that's what they say. And here's one more. Acts 7, 59, when Stephen was killed. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Okay, so Steve, Stephen says something very similar. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen says, Lord, lay not their sin to their charge. Okay, because what they have done is absolutely evil and wicked. So he's praying that to God. Okay, and is an act of intercession for his persecutors. Okay, so let's look at these things. First of all, just because they prayed for their persecutors to be forgiven doesn't mean they were automatically forgiven. Because what did we learn? No one is forgiven without repentance. No one in the Bible is told, you are forgiven who has not repented. No one. Oh, you're just automatically forgiven even though there's no repentance. No, it has to be repentance. Just because they prayed for them doesn't mean they're automatically forgiven. If that were true in the case of Jesus, if that were true, he said, oh, Father, forgive them, and they're all forgiven. If that were true in the case of Jesus, then why was Jerusalem in 70 AD after that absolutely destroyed by Rome and so many Jews were crucified there that they said there was no more room left to crucify people. Couldn't even fit any more crosses to, to nail people to. All the Jews that were being killed. And this was after the Jews had said about Jesus, Matthew 27, 25, then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Well, guess what? It was. And in 70 AD, Jerusalem was wrecked. Titus came in, destroyed. Jesus told the Jews to their face exactly what would happen to them after they had rejected him as Messiah. Let's look at it. In uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city of Jerusalem and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known... Even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, the opportunity that you had. But now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days shall come upon thee, 
that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, kill you, and thy children with thee, and shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Doesn't look like they were forgiven, does it? No! Jesus prophesied that's what happened, and they weren't forgiven. After the crucifixion of Christ, they were killed. Their city was destroyed. As he said, the temple was completely destroyed. Not one stone left upon another. They even plowed up stones in the ground to make sure that wasn't the case. Were they all forgiven? If they were forgiven, why was it all destroyed? That doesn't make any sense. With Stephen, let's, let's talk about him. With Stephen, again, it does not say anyone was pardoned simply because Stephen prayed. Oh, Lord, lay not their sins to their charge. Does that mean their sin wasn't laid to their charge? The only people who received forgiveness were those who repented at the preaching of the apostles. So after that, there's preaching by the apostles. And some people got saved, but they got saved because they repented and believed the gospel. They weren't, they weren't just forgiven because Stephen said, oh, lay not the sin to their charge, so God just automatically didn't lay the sin to their charge. False. Absolutely false. And furthermore, Paul, the apostle, one of the persecutors there at Stephen's death, he was there. Paul, the apostle, before he was saved, was at the death of Stephen. Paul was, before he was saved, I'm sorry, Paul, one of the persecutors there at Stephen's death, was saved and forgiven after turning to Christ on the road to Damascus. Jesus asked Paul why he was continuing to persecute. Acts chapter 9, verse not, uh, 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Oh, I thought Stephen said, lay not the sin to their charge. So obviously Paul, who was Saul at that time, right? He was just forgiven. Then why does Jesus ask him, why are you persecuting me? Which is a sin. Yeah. Why are you continuing to sin against me? He was not forgiven before that moment. Okay? You see what I'm saying here? Stephen said, don't lay this sin to their charge. But from that moment until the moment that Paul got saved, he was not forgiven. He was only forgiven when he met Christ on the road to Damascus. After Paul was saved, he said what? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he had counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before, in the past, a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Okay? So Paul the Apostle says, Before I got saved by Jesus Christ, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor. What did Jesus say to Paul before he was saved? Why do you persecute me? He, is, he wasn't forgiven. He was a persecutor. So, notice to, that both Jesus and Stephen prayed to God for forgiveness to their for their persecutors. They never told anyone that they were forgiven okay this is such a key distinction that you got to get down see this is plainly taught in the bible jesus prayed to god father forgive them stephen said lord lay not the sin to the charge they didn't look at anyone who was involved in murdering them saying i forgive you jesus didn't say that or stephen didn't say that he didn't say i forgive you you are forgiven they are interceding to God saying, God, please forgive them if it be possible. Well, guess what? They're not going to be forgiven unless they repent. So it's an intercessory prayer. That's what they want for them. And that's what you should pray for. That's a good thing. Yes, you should pray that they would be forgiven and they'd be saved. You should pray for your enemies. But you don't tell them you're forgiven. In fact, no one in the entire New Testament ever tells a wicked person that they're forgiven unless they repent or put their faith in Christ first. Never, not one time. Think about all the times 
Jesus said to them, oh, your, you know, your sins are forgiven thee. Rise up and walk. All these things. They had already trembled, fell down at his feet, put their faith in him, expressed faith in him. Then he says, you're forgiven. What does he say to the Pharisees? Ye serpents, degeneration of vipers, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? A little different, isn't it? So yes, we should pray to God that our enemies would be forgiven. Pray that. But that does not mean we need to tell our enemies they are forgiven. Okay, do you see the difference here? Pray for your enemies. That they would repent, believe the gospel, and be saved. That they'd be forgiven. That they would be turned from the enemies of God to the friends of God. And maybe also then be your friends after. But you don't need to tell them to their face, you are forgiven. The Bible says clearly to pray for your enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. It says to do good to them, and this is in contrast to taking revenge. We are plainly told, we are told plainly to not take revenge. And this is where I'm going to deal with the other extreme of people. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in, doing, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so we're told plainly in the Bible, do not avenge yourself. Meaning, don't take revenge. Don't desire to take revenge against people. Be driven by um, anger and hate. Harbor that bitterness in your heart. These types of things against people. And so this is a rebuke to the other extreme. The right-wingers, which I see all the time, saying, I want revenge. Right? That's what they're saying. I don't just want change. I want revenge against all these people that did these things to me. I want to take revenge upon them. It's ungodly. It's fleshly. These are the fruits of a wicked heart. This is not of God to say, I want to take revenge. I want it to. If you hear anybody talk about taking revenge, it's not of God. I don't care who, it, who says it. You're conservative, you're right wing, I don't care. Reactionaries, right? NRX, whatever it is, I want to take revenge. Well, see where that takes you. Because you're definitely not on the side of God. And no matter how much they all claim to be, oh sure, they'll do it. The time comes that he will they will kill you. Whoever kills you thinks they do God's service. They think they're doing God's will, but it's not. Because God plainly says, avenge not yourselves. Vengeance belongs to God. God will do right. When he wants to, he will have vengeance. And in the, in the end, in the day of judgment, anyone who has not repented will be held accountable, will be punished. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. Will anyone escape the day of judgment? No, absolutely not. Okay, so we're not supposed to have revenge in our hearts, desire for that. We are told to do these things because this is what God does for all the wicked men on earth. Okay, look at, look at this, Luke chapter 6 verse 35. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. Don't expect them to do anything nice back. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Okay? It says God is kind to the unthankful, to the evil. Here's another one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And to send, he sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Not just the good. He also sends rain to the evil, to the unjust to the unthankful. 
He even allows them to live, allows them to have good things. To wake up every day, to breathe, to have food and clothing and shelter. Even a lot of them have prosperity beyond belief. He allows them to have those things, gives, those, gives them those things, even though they're wicked and, and unthankful. Notice something. It says God is kind to the unthankful and evil, but it never once says he tells them they are forgiven of their evil. See that? It says he's kind to them. He, he gives them these things. It says the rain and, and the food and all these other things he gives them, but he never says, hey, you, you're forgiven. You're forgiven of your sin and evil and rebellion against me that you breathe out every single day of your life. Yeah, that's all forgiven. No, doesn't say that. We already saw earlier how God only forgives those who repent. God does not just let the guilty off the hook with no accountability. Let's look. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. God will not clear the guilty without repentance. Here's another one. Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. You are not getting acquitted by God if you're wicked without repentance. He's not just going to automatically clear the guilty, acquit the wicked without repentance. It's not going to happen. God is a God of justice. And so God does good things, though, to them. And the good that God does to the wicked is intended to lead them to repentance, which it says in the Bible right here, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and riches of his what? Goodness. And forbearance, holding back his wrath, and long suffering, he's very long suffering to the wicked, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But so often the wicked see God's goodness, they experience it. The forbearance of God, he doesn't just strike them dead as soon as they do something bad. He is long suffering, he puts up with their evil rebellion day after day, month after month, year after year, their evil, wicked, blaspheming of rebellion, their pride, he puts up with it. He's long suffering. And still, they don't see and recognize and appreciate the goodness of God, which should lead them to repentance. No, instead they continue in rebellion and sin. But it should lead them to repentance. And that's why God does it. So just because God does good doesn't mean to the wicked doesn't mean they're automatically forgiven. It says the goodness that he does should lead them to repentance. Which would lead to what? Forgiveness. And therefore, just because God does good to the wicked doesn't mean he says you are forgiven. There it is. God wants the wicked to repent instead of perish. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want them to perish in hell. He wants the wicked to repent. But in the end, all will not repent, and therefore all will not be forgiven. All those who refuse to repent and die in their sins without Jesus Christ will end up in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, eternal death, everlasting punishment. Everlasting shame and contempt, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, and the smoke of their torment riseth up forever and ever. That's the lake of fire. And everyone who refuses to repent of the murder, the sorcery, the, the, um, the lying, will go there. They will not be forgiven. 
that's what will happen. Well, if they're just automatically forgiven, why do all these groups of people go to the lake of fire? Because they're not forgiven without repentance. That's what God teaches. Now, one last point to end this. One last point concerning the treatment of criminals, especially ones who have committed a heinous act like murder. Permanently ending someone's life. No going back. Murder. We already saw that you are not to tell someone you forgive them without repentance. Someone kills one of your family members. There's nowhere in the Bible it says you you have to go to them and say, Hey, I forgive you for murdering my family member. No. Absolutely not. But even if a murderer said they repent, and maybe even repented to God genuinely, that still does not take away the need for justice. Even Paul the Apostle said he would accept the death penalty if he deserved it. Let me just read that and then we'll end talking about this. Uh, Acts chapter 25 verse 11. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Paul had no problem with that death penalty. If I committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Kill me. He said, I'll accept that. He'd accept that, the death penalty. Many times the criminals will say they are sorry or even say they were converted to try to get a lighter sentence or get out of prison earlier. Those who truly do repent will know and say they deserve to be punished and are not entitled to any leniency. That's how you know someone has truly uh, repented. Now, I'm not saying someone may not truly, maybe a murderer. I'm not saying they can't truly repent. They can. The Bible even says murderers can repent. That doesn't mean they escape, escape accountability. That's a fact. They still have to deal with the consequences of what they did. Just because they repent doesn't take back what happened. It doesn't bring that person back to life that they killed. Justice still has to go on. Even if they are truly reconciled to God. And maybe someone truly does get repent. And they truly are completely changed. And maybe someone after that person has repented... After some time of mourning, please give some space. And they, and then the, the victim's family see that after some time has gone by and they see this genuine repentance. Hey, that's up to them. If they want to say they're forgiven, whatever. But not this perverted, twisted version of it. You just rush to say, I forgive you. Or they just say, I'm sorry, so that they can get out earlier. Hey, can I get out? Or I'm converted. I've changed my ways. Can you lighten my sentence? No. If they are converted, they will be like, I cannot believe what I did. It's so evil and wicked. I deserve to rot in here. I deserve death. That's the repentant heart. He will say, he will smite his chest and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I don't even want to look at anyone. Because of the wicked, evil thing that I have done. That's real repentance. Not trying to get off the hook and get out earlier and an easier punishment. That's manipulation. Punishing criminals is supposed to be a deterrent to evil. That's a good thing. If you just rush to tell them they're forgiven, you are emboldening all other criminals to commit more evil deeds. The Bible says that. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily is the last verse we're reading because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil okay and this is true in society okay so listen we have how forgiveness works with God salvation that is separate from how things should work with justice in society and one of these, this verse shows one of the things that should happen in society is that when an evil work is done like murder, there should be a sentence executed speedily against it. And when that doesn't happen, everyone else who wants to do evil watches that. It says the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. They say, you know what? Look at this person did that evil thing. Justice wasn't executed against them. So, hey, 
No big deal if I go do it too. I will choose now to go do these evil things because I know chances are I'm going to get away with it or if I get in trouble, it's not going to be that big of a sentence. And that's why there should be this accountability and say, hey, no, you, you need to have justice executed against you. You do something like that. Don't just rush to say, oh, oh, they killed my, my child. Oh, you're forgiven. That's insane. It's unnatural. It's unbiblical. And it doesn't help society either. It's wrong in every which way you can think of. Finally, we should have both mercy and justice in their proper places and never to the exclusion of the other. We are never to have mercy without justice and never to have justice without mercy. Have to have both. And the perfect example of where mercy and justice met together is Jesus Christ. Because we're all sinners and deserve to be punished, Jesus Christ satisfied the divine justice of God by dying for our sins. And also, because God is a God of love and mercy, the greatest act of love and mercy in history that ever has happened and ever will happen is Jesus Christ left heaven to die on the cross for our sins. That was an act of love and mercy. And so mercy and justice meet together in Jesus Christ perfectly. And so we are to reflect that mercy and justice in our application towards each other. In our personal relationships, in, the, in society, in a courtroom, when crimes are committed, there should be, there has to be justice, but also don't forget mercy as well where it's appropriate, never to the exclusion of the other one. Balanced. That's the biblical teaching. And so I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I'm sure there's a, there's even more I could say. I could keep going on and on about <laughs> other verses and different types of things, but I think this is a uh, overview of the concept of forgiveness to clearly illustrate to you how the concept of Christian forgiveness is being weaponized to be used against you as a Christian. It's being used to uh, against society to allow evil to thrive unrestrained, no accountability, destroy accountability, indulge evil, as I said. It's, it's having an evil effect. And also, I hope that those on the other extreme that don't want to forgive, that do want to take revenge, you see the warnings from Scripture too, that you don't want to go too far in the other direction either. But keep it biblical. And I think that's about it. So thank you for watching and listening. Please like, share, subscribe, especially click the links below the uh, description below to subscribe to the Telegram feed where you will get all the updates, extras, notes, news. It's all on the Telegram feed. And all the alternative platforms are there. Thank you for all the support and all the prayers. God bless you. Have a good day.